All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for an NBFC roundtable talk. My name is Rachel Bozinski, and I'm facilitating our conversation this afternoon. I'm currently the Chief of Training and Education for the NBFC, but I previously had the great pleasure of managing our National Junior Firefighter Program for almost 10 years, and I met our panelists through that, uh, and it was a great experience. As you know, probably if you're logging onto this call, junior firefighter programs are a great way to engage young people in the fire service. It's great for youth as a way to learn about local emergency response organizations in a safe, educational, and fun way and build leadership skills. It's also, of course, a great way to add some non-operational support to your fire department and a powerful recruitment tool for moving down the road. That said, it can be difficult to know where to start, how to grow a program, how can you best engage with local organizations, support youth, engage parents, and have an overall successful program? So that's what we're gonna talk about today, how to focus on best practices and strategies for building a strong youth program in your community. Before we jump into that, we're gonna open a short poll. So we wanna hear more about where you're coming from today, uh, best how you would best describe your department, urban, suburban, or rural, and also the region of the United States that you're based out of. We know every state, every region kind of has their little nuances. So we just wanna get an idea of who is in the virtual room with us today. So we'll give you a, just a few minutes to answer that. While you're answering, we had a discussion among our panelists uh, earlier today about what exactly is suburban, because that can mean a lot of things depending on where you are in the country. I'm based in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C., and it's technically suburban, but it's got a bigger population than, you know, half of Texas. So um, it, just use your best guess there, what you would define yourself as. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this to, ah, I see our poll results are up. So we do have over half identifying as rural departments. We have 55%, 40% suburban, and just about 5% as urban. So thank you all for being on, regardless of where you're representing. Um, it looks like a majority is considered Northeast, New England, Mid-Atlantic. We have Midwest, South, and a few people from the West. So thanks for calling in during your morning time. We appreciate you being here. All right, so with that, I am going to go ahead and let our panelists introduce themselves to you. And if you all would just mention too how you would identify your department based on those parameters. And we'll start with Quentin Cash. Quentin Cash, I am a career battalion chief in Shelby, North Carolina, uh, and I'm a volunteer assistant chief in Cherville. Uh, I serve as the North Carolina director to the National Volunteer Fire Council, uh, representing the North Carolina State Firefighters Association, where I'm a past president. Uh, I grew up in our junior program. I uh, have been through it. I have helped run it. I'm still heavily involved in it. So uh, it's a great program and we would not be functioning without it. But as far as my volunteer department goes, we are a small combination suburban and we are definitely in the South. If you can't tell from my draw. <laughs> Thanks, Quentin. Jerry, over to you next. Um my name is Jerry Presta. I am the program advisor for uh, our junior program in East Norwich, and that's uh, in Long Island, New York. Uh, we're really a suburban uh, department. I've been the the advisor for 26 years. I just started my 26 years. I got involved in the program when my kids came home from school and asked about the junior program at the firehouse. And uh, before I could even ask the chief about it, I was the advisor. So uh, knowing the, the importance of the program, even after my kids had left the program, uh, I really need, to, the, the need to, to stick around because of the importance. And I run a, uh, an organization for the entire county of Nassau, which takes into case of about 900 juniors, and we do programs and, 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 and things with that. But it's a, it's a very important program, and we've had great success my chief and assistant chief both were my juniors. So the program works and we get a lot of recruitment from the junior program. Uh, most are our offices now. Great, thanks, Jerry. Looking forward to hearing more about your program. And then last but not least, Ellen. 
Hi, I'm Ellen Yarborough. I'm deputy chief of South Media Fire Company. It's a all volunteer uh, company of two in a single department in suburban Philadelphia. Uh, I'm also by trade a high school teacher. So I came into the fire service on the heels of my son when he joined when he was 14. I never had any intentions of becoming a firefighter. And uh, and I just really took to it as quickly and as enthusiastically as he did. And one of the things I noticed was that while our school didn't have the means or the ability to fund a program uh, in our school during the school day, we had a robust tech program that wasn't necessarily right for everybody. So I took the opportunity to develop a program for high schoolers who wanted to remain in school for our school district that didn't have the funds for something on site so that our students who serve the community are able to earn academic credit at school for that and that recognition. So I've been doing that since 2018 and advise other schools to do the same. Fantastic. Love to hear about that family pipeline and recruitment kind of work in both ways. All right. Well, thank you again to all three of you for being here. You're just experts in the subject matter, and we're excited to learn more from you today. So I do have a list of questions I'm going to be asking, but for our attendees here, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A as well. Um, and we will get to as many as we can as time allows. We do plan to wrap up um, at the end of the hour, so 3 p.m. Eastern time. And I guess with that, we will get started. So Ellen, I'm gonna to go to you first. You mentioned your work with the school districts. So how can someone start doing that? If they're interested in working more closely with the schools, who's the first person they contact? How do they set up a working relationship? It, it's gonna depend on the school, their local school district or private school around them. Obviously there was a benefit for for us in that I was already in the school and knew who to go to. But as I advise others, um, there are actually two different uh, roles uh, for um, uh, you know people to approach in a given school district. And initially I was going through the guidance counselors because I already knew what we were providing through or that what the county was providing through the tech school program. So they already had a student profile. Um, but what I have found since that initial contact is that superintendents are increasingly looking for a way to um, bolster the, the role that students play in the community. Uh, there are pathways programs to graduation for students who aren't able to be successful in the standard curriculum. And, uh, and a lot of schools don't have those county resources. So the schools are really scrambling, districts are scrambling to find opportunities for students to get out into the community uh, and be productive. So that partnership I'm finding um, and that initial contact with a superintendent and a, a department chief is proving to be a really fruitful one and much easier than I anticipated happening. I always saw superintendents, even my own, as being big picture people, um, but there's, there's that pressure to provide every kind of kid that walks through the door equal opportunity for um, for advancement and success at the high school level. So um, that's a great first go-to. And then for the day-to-day -day operations, normally it's a guidance counselor who's going to be your go-to person. That's great feedback. Uh, Quentin, Perry, have either of you had experiences working with the local school district? Yeah, we do most of our recruiting uh, through the school and we get uh, major participation uh, through the uh, the principals, we have uh, you know lower lower middle and 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 high school, and we'll go into the middle and high school uh, to offer programs on fire safety. But in the you know in the the back end story, we're really trying to recruit for the junior program, which we find very very successful. Uh, we usually go to the middle school. We start our program about twelve at twelve years old, so we'll go into the middle school, which is sixth grade, and we'll pitch it to them. And we walk out of there um, with minimum uh, six to eight kids every time we go. So we don't go every year. We go like every other year. Um, but they bring their friends in. And um, and this, the superintendent, like, you know, Ellen said, um, like we were honored to receive the NVFC uh, program of the year uh, last year. And we actually invited the principal and the superintendent to the ceremony. And they came and, you know, they see what their kids actually are part of. So it was, you know, we get a very major support from the school system. That's a great idea to loop them into your success and really show them what's happening. Definitely. Quentin, did you have anything to add? 
nothing other than what Jerry already said. Uh, and yeah. one end we found, which I'll talk about later, is uh, the coaches. The high school sports coaches have been very beneficial for us. Okay. So it sounds like there's a couple of different um, ways to go about this. Ellen's is more of a formal program that is you know, skills training, whereas Jerry and Quinton is more of a recruitment tool through other outreach. Okay. So, Jerry, coming back to you, um, I know you were mentioning how much you've done with countywide programs, um, with some of the bigger picture. I know you've worked with your state association, too. So how can people connect with regional and state associations to promote junior firefighting? Well, we usually promote different things around the state and we'll advertise, like especially through our New York State Association. They do youth days, which are simple, you know, stretching hose lines, stuff like that. And they'll do it around the state. So we try to connect with them. We try to move it around to the different areas that, you know, the average person, since it's a day or one day program, they're no more than like traveling two hours. So we'll kind of geographically, you know, space them out and get them more and more involved and give them things that they might not get in their own department. That's the biggest thing, the diversity of the training. You Some departments might not have the capability of doing some training, but they can go to an, a neighboring department, which I will go like an hour away to a neighboring department and they'll see different types. And even if it's the same type of training, it's just a different reach on how that department does it. So it's 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 a great opportunity to uh, and then with our countywide program, you know, we we stretch across the county and we do different things in Suffolk County, which is our next county in Westchester County, which is to the north of us, an hour and a half hour away. And we invite them to do different things to be part of of that, not just, hey, we're we're in Nassau County. Nobody else can come. You know, we invite everybody. Uh, you know, because again, it's not about the county. It's not about the department. It's it's we're trying to better the the the, the you know the the fire service overall. What, what, Absolutely. When, when we're a success, everybody's a success. That's great, Ellen. Have, do you have any connections? Have you worked with more regional or state level? I have as an individual. We don't have anything as uh, like county wide organized uh, like Jerry does. I follow his his site on social media and it really is. It's an incredible program. Um, but what I found is that we have a, in Pennsylvania, there's a state focus group for recruitment and retention. And uh, as of late, there's a lot of attention being paid to recruitment of junior firefighters. Um, there's been an adjustment in allowances for students as young as 14 to begin that uh, firefighter one sequence and a reduction of the age requirement from 18 to 17 for interior, the, that final burn for the fire one or essentials program. So there's been some big changes. Uh, and uh, there's also been opportunities. Pennsylvania has a um, fire and emergency services uh, nonprofit organization, which seeks to promote the fire service throughout the state. And they highlight people from different counties to then come in and kind of cross county work, participate in things like a webinar or a podcast and the like. So we've been doing it that way, but there's nothing as organized or so organized on the state level specific to junior recruitment and retention. And Jerry, I did see a question pop up about the youth days. Someone asked if those are um, recruitment activities for junior members, or are they used to remote camaraderie among various junior programs? Both. Um, uh, we definitely want to share the knowledge of the different departments around the state who sponsor these groups, but definitely it's a camaraderie. Even uh, in the county organization we have, like, you know, everybody's now across the county, the kids are talking to one another, who's going to who's prom, who's going to hang out with this one, who's going with that one. Something we never had before because, you know, our old, you know, the bay doors are down, that's it. You know, this is our department and, you know, we, we don't cross the line of going outside. You know, now we're actually talking and we're, we're sharing ideas and going to different firehouses and, and seeing the different things. But the, de the youth days definitely are, are, are shared to promote camaraderie. Um, I know with FASNI, what you know, you have to be a junior to actually participate. You just, we don't, but we do hold um, different things around the state, like Firefighter for the Day, which is almost like a mini open house where you can you get the people in and then, you know, we can do different things with them in an individual thing around each department. But the youth days, yes, I mean, they're very successful. They're always booked. I mean, 
we have anywhere from 40 to 60 to 100 kids on on each of each of these events and there's usually around new york state there's about about four to five a year okay yeah and quentin i know you're involved at the state level in north carolina is there connections for the junior program at that level too for the junior program we really don't do a whole lot uh statewide from the state association what we do is legislatively try to get in and get the laws changed when people bring us ideas of hey like ellen was talking about 17 year olds 16 year olds being able to participate that's our big role from the state association side and pushing the nbfc junior program which we've been doing for years because we helped build that program 15 18 years ago when we first started uh one below us our neighbors south carolina state association at their annual conference they have a junior competition uh, and it's very cool to go watch at their annual conference. Uh, we've been down there the last two years because we have a good relationship with South Carolina and their board attends our annual conference and we attend theirs. And it's something that we're looking at maybe putting in North Carolina in the future. But uh, currently all of our stuff done at a uh, local or county level. Okay. Well, that's really interesting to hear about. We'll have to keep updated when you're adding yeah, that. Really? That sounds well. uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Good. Well, something that you kind of mentioned with the youth days, Jerry, and Ellen, I know this is really important to you, is bringing in juniors from a lot of different backgrounds and really making the program open, appealing, welcoming to kids from all different backgrounds, um, you know, diversity, socioeconomic, all those things. So, Jerry, you know, I know you have a great success story with your all-girl board. Do you have any advice on how you've made that really open? And you want to tell people a little bit about that? Well, uh, as the association, um, we have it's run by a board of juniors, and we kind of oversee them. Um, so there's six different departments that make up the board: vice presidents, treasurers, and everything. And um, they run for positions. And the female population has gotten has grown as far as wanting to participate, which you know, which is great. We used to have to go and beg for people to run for positions. Now. We have people running for multiple positions, two and three people for each positions. Our elections are like two hours long, which is fine with us. And, um, you know, last year, you know, everybody put their name in the hat and did their little speech and went to the elections and everybody got elected. I got the names and I'm calling the names off. And as I'm reading them, I'm like, these are all girls. And I got to the last one. I go, I got a full board of girls here. I said, this is this is great. And, uh, you know, uh, we swore them in and uh, we had one of the best years uh, last year. Um, and we're looking forward to it, you know, another year. And even in the uh, the installation dinner, when we swore them all in for, uh, for this year, I didn't want to slight the other 17 past years. Um, but it was really great to have, they, they brought a new energy to the, uh, to the association and uh, we really got a lot of stuff done and they were very well respected and, they, they ran very professional, like what we expected. And uh, it was it was great. And, you know, we, we're and because of that, we're holding in April our first all female training uh, seminar uh, that we're going to be holding at the Fire Academy. We have uh, speakers, all female chiefs, uh, EMS chief, fire chiefs. And we have the second FDNY battalion chief ever is going to come and sit down and speak to the girls. Uh, and then we're going to do some evolutions in the afternoon. That's really fantastic. I'm curious, did you, was there anything out of the ordinary that you did leading up to that to really create that welcoming environment or was it just natural? And... It was just natural because, okay. I mean, the association has been around since 2006 and they've all worked together. They've all, you know, and they do trainings together and we split them up purposely, you know, where we, we, you know, we won't stick like 15 girls in one squad, or, you know, we divide them up that they intermingle and some are like, Oh, we want to be with our friends. I said, listen, you'll be with your friends. But you know, when you go to mutual aid, when you join the department, you got to learn to work with other people. So here's a perfect opportunity to meet people because you're going to go on a mutual aid. You're going to be right next to a firefighter that you don't even know, but you have to work together. Yeah. That's a great point. And Ellen, I know you've talked about this aspect and some of the, the training that you've done for us. Did you want to add anything? Well, sure. And when I'm speaking today, um, it's important, I think, that I, I distinguish between programs. So Pennsylvania has 
uh, the county technical high schools. So I, I've mentioned that. So, and, and ours is a particularly robust one. And the current um, firefighter and instructor who's now leading that has done just an amazing job of bringing in kids. He's got his largest group ever. Um, and that's been around for a long time. There's lots of chiefs in the county who came up through that vote tech system. My program is those other kids, the kids that aren't going, you know, half a day to a tech school or, or have something in their school where they have an emergency services course, you know, as part of their regular school day. So we kind of pluck kids one by one um, into our membership. And uh, our, our best tool has been our existing members and our social media. So if we have one female, guess what? We're putting the female, the young ladies in pictures. Um, and last year, uh, we had a particularly robust group of juniors in terms of uh, diversity in that we'll count Colombian American, Indian American, Chinese American, uh, and all three of those are first generation. And then uh, we have African American and then who we normally see in suburban Philadelphia firehouses and those are, are white kids you know, like my kids. Um, and, and, and that even seeing one person who looks like me remotely like me has skin tone that's offset like me, I'm more likely to join that organization. So um, just by nature of the beast, now that that kind of rolls itself, we don't really have to keep doing that. I just keep our social media present with our current members, throw in pictures of our former members. And, and it's always demonstrating that we're accepting of everybody. Um, and it hasn't caused any issues. I, I know some people are fearful to make a big change. Well, we don't, we've never had a young woman in our firehouse or we're an all white firehouse or an all black firehouse. How are we going to adjust to having somebody that doesn't look like them? Um, and it certainly hopes to have, or helps to have open conversation when it comes to that. Yeah. And I feel like we can learn so much from the youth are so adaptable. They'll just say, all right, let's go train. So <laughs> whoever you are. That's um, I so I just want to shift gears a little to keep us moving along. So, Quentin, I'm going to ask you if you have a great success story from your program or department. Just just a couple of quick things, Rachel. Uh, okay, Jerry, Jerry hit on one of ours with uh, we have had two national firefighter junior firefighter of the year through the NBFC and one program one year. So that is big to take them up there and get them to experience the spring meet and get the awards. That's a, a big success for them and for our department and for our state, really. Uh, and we tout that statewide. So that's success. But uh, earlier I mentioned when they were talking about teachers and principals was coaches, uh, a recruitment issue. We were, you know, we were a family run fire department for years and years. It was all family members. Their kids were the juniors. Their kids, kids became the juniors. So it was a common cycle, but we started seeing that fall off. So we started thinking, how can we reach out to uh, get some more juniors interested? And we put our minds together and it comes to talking to the coaches because what is fighting fire like? Fighting fire is like being on a sports team. You got to be in shape, which sports teams are. You got to be able to listen to a coach, which is the same thing as listening to an incident commander or listening to a captain uh, in charge of a junior program. You've got to be able to work as a team for a common goal, which is what sports is. And you've also got to uh, build that brotherhood and sisterhood, which is what sports does. So it's just such a common connection for us, especially now when we built our new station in 2008. We built it across the street from the fire department. I mean, from the high school football field and baseball field, put their mascot on our patch. And actually, our station colors are designed around the school colors. So it's just been a good recruitment tool for us. The other big success in recruiting for us has been to be able to sell full-time firefighters. Um, most of our juniors, if they have that desire, they can get hired full time. We have got a good relationship with the counties around us and the departments in our county that are career. And they know if they come through Cherryville's junior firefighter program, they're going to be good employees. Uh, even at my career department at Shell, we have 56, seven of us came through Cherryville's junior program and all seven of us are still volunteers at Cherryville. So those are our really big success stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great. And we actually had a question pop up about how many of your juniors continue on after they graduate or go on to college uh, in the fire service. Generally, I would say probably 40 to 45 percent of ours actually go on to mm -hmm. be career. Um, and 
they most times stay on the fire department uh, unless they can move to a larger metro city. We're about 45 minutes southwest of Charlotte. So some of those that get hired at Charlotte, they have to move a little closer so the drive's not so long. But past that, most of them stay. Like I said, all, all seven on my career department, including myself, are still members at Cherville. Yeah. Jerry and Ellen, I saw you nod. Do you have similar rates of, of students who stay on after? Yeah, we have a lot. We have a college program that we do that that works out really well. Um, you know, as everybody has in the firehouse, you have a percentage you have to make, uh, you know, to keep up your, 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 your membership. So we give the opportunity of these kids to go away to college and only have to make a certain percentage when they come back. This way, they're still part of the, ser the fire service. We found that if we didn't do that before we instituted this program about ten years ago, they would be they would leave the junior program and they would be all you know yeah no problem going to come back after school going to join going to never happened. So we found that keeping them engaged and then when they come home during the summer and breaks and everything we keep them engaged that after they graduate whether it's a two or four year program they stick around because they've already, that's why we're such a, you know, uh, when I go around with the NVFC and we speak on juniors or FASNI, I, I say about the age, about the 12 year old age, about joining earlier, keeping them engaged and grabbing them at an early age, it's the same principle as keeping them engaged when they're away at college. You've got to keep that continuity. If you don't keep that continuity, you're going to lose them. All right. Thank you. Ellen, did you want to add on that? Yeah, I can add on to that. So I would say that we have a real mix of of career choices for our students. Uh, our firehouse is in a neighborhood that would be really expensive and, and not very desirable for 20 somethings to to stay at. So we'll lose a lot of students. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. when, upon graduation, when that happens, obviously it's it's a little bit sad. But what I say is, somebody's going to benefit from these kids, even if they don't return to service. We do have kids in in career now, fire, um, but we also have students who then go on to college and they're part of their college EMT crews. We have students who uh, then went off to military schools. Both to uh, one is becoming a pilot. Now, the other is entering the Naval Academy. So uh, I've written letters of recommendation. I fielded calls from people at police academies asking about our juniors. So um, wherever they go, they seem to be heavily involved in some sort of public service, health and human services, if not the fire service. So it, it, it's, it's kind of, I, I think that's a win either way. <coughs> Um, if they're still people focused and community focused wherever they go. Well, and regardless, you've got people who are future residents of your communities who understand the value of the fire service and what it's contributing and where to find their local fire station. Without a doubt. Absolutely. I So I did want to ask, we had a question pop up and for all the great success stories, there are definitely, you know, the the tricky parts of managing a program. So Someone was asking about liability and parent buy-in to that. And, you know, Alan, I know we had talked about what information do we provide parents and what are their expectations for while their child is in the firehouse? Can you speak to that? Sure. Um, I'm at odds with some folks in my firehouse. I, part of me wants to, and this isn't a really well-developed idea, but um, while we might lose juniors upon graduation, oftentimes we hold on to parents. I'm an example of that. There are a couple other dads who are an example of that with students who just graduated and uh, and now they're fully involved. There are drivers, they're interior firefighters, all of that. So there's a win even when the students move on. Um, but I, I debate whether or not we should have some sort of requirement when we take on somebody, we'll take kids as young as 14, which is really young. Um, we don't want to be their babysitter, just the place they are when they're not at home. Um, so I've debated and I've tried to promote the value of having the parents become involved in some way or another, even if it's just planning the annual dinner and the like. And we have been successful at that. We have a, a father who's an IT guy who's now switched out all of our monitors um, all of our TVs has updated a couple of our systems because his daughter is benefiting from it. And he says, this is how I'm going to spend my time. So pulling those parents in, I think, has value. As others say, well, we want it to be their choice. We don't want to mandate that. We might lose 
the kid too. And, and I don't think so, at least not from the parent perspective, because this is an opportunity for them to do something in person, hands on with, uh, with their teens. And, and we're all lacking that as a society right now. Um, you know, the kids are downstairs in the rec room on their devices and the parents are uh, catching up for work the next day. Um, but at any rate, for the moment, whenever our students join us and begin the junior program, they get a binder. And in that binder is information for their parents. There's signatures required from everything from the um, uh, you know, township harassment policy to the Pennsylvania State Junior Compliance Manual to course descriptions for uh, the, the county fire academy so the students know what they can do when, at what age, what's the sequence of courses. Uh, we'll have handouts on uh, skills work that we do, the training that we do either Monday or, or Sunday mornings um, that we'll usually have a classroom section and then go out and do physical work so that they can see that skills development, what's expected of students, what they're allowed to do at a particular age, um, various handouts about restrictions, and uh, and of course, the online resources for the National Volunteer Fire Council too. They're invaluable. Okay. Well, and Quentin, I'll move that over to you then, because a lot of the documents the Junior Firefighter Program has was originally provided by Cherubal, so thank you for that. Uh, they continue to help people. Um, can you add a little more about parent engagement? I can. It, we definitely involve the parents heavily, if, if we can. You know, some don't have the time or don't want to be involved, but if you can, that's extremely huge. Uh, and a lot of times, like uh, Ellen said, you end up with that uh, parent becoming a member and that parent running that program at some point, which is big, but uh, the National Junior Volunteer uh, Program is online. It's a 10-step process. I've seen some questions pop in about people not knowing where to start or what's the best way to recruit. Uh, this is the second edition of that program. It's probably about 30 pages long, but you should definitely give it a check if you don't know where to start because it talks about securing department support because you got to do that first. And then assessing liability. Somebody was asking or talking about liability, you know, finding out what you can, what you can't do. Is your insurance company going to cover you? Uh, is workers comp going to cover you? There's a bunch of issues that come into play there, but talks about onboarding advisors, you know, determining the appropriate age range for your fire department, establishing what your members can and can't do, uh, you know, setting the minimum requirements for the youth participants, formulating the programs, operating guidelines and SOGs, you know, working on finding funding, because if it's a new program, you know, what do you do? Uh, where do you start that? Do you have the money for it? So there's ways to find funding. Step nine in that program is, selecting and recruiting participants and then utilizing resources to maintain your program. So really it's a good 10, 10 step process. Uh, and the second edition does come out October, November last October. year. It really is a good resource. So please check it out if you never have. I'd like to second that since I helped edit that, that updated edition. And I, yeah, I do think it's a, it's a valuable resource and it, and it doesn't just promote one model. So I know that we've got a variety of, viewers today from, uh, I think it was 55% from rural districts. So I know that one of their concerns would be funding. And so there are op definitely opportunities that can come from looking at that document and seeing things that are not cost prohibitive, um, that are gonna really turn off your membership and supporting a program like this. Uh, not all of us can have really robust countywide programs Sometimes we have to just work with the, the 25 people that we have racks for in our own stations. Yeah. You definitely, you definitely don't want to turn off, um, you know, uh, uh, starting a junior program or even a family that might not be able to afford to buy the kid the uniform if, if, the, if the fire company can't afford to really, um, you know, uh, you know uh, give everybody uniforms. You, you really don't want to, um, you know, turn off uh, a kid saying, uh, you know, a uh, parent saying, no, I can't join because I'm not going to be able to buy the uniform, but I don't want to tell a kid that. And then you lose a, a possible member. And then, you know, you, we're not doing our job, basically, even though the junior firefighter program is what we're, we're, we're molding them to come into the fire service. That's what the whole program is about. Um, but it is a youth program. It is trying to shape, uh, you know, these kids and keep them off the street and give them career paths. Uh, I can't tell you how many of, uh, of the, the kids in the last 26 years of the They've gone to emergency management, mm -hmm. uh, first responder careers because of the junior program. They had no direction. They come in there. I want to be a dispatcher. I want fire science. I want to be a fire marshal. I want to do this all because of the junior program. So it's not just, you know, we're looking to 
um, bring our juniors into the into the fire service to, you know, uh, keep the fire service going. But we are really looking to kind of mold them and 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 put them in the proper direction in life. Some need it. Well, and on that note, um, you know, we were going to talk a little bit about how you do handle sometimes when there might be behavioral issues. And Ellen, you got a shout out in questions. Tony and Correa would like to know how you handle adolescent development and maturity <laughs> in your junior programs. Well, I'll address that. I'll address Tony's question uh, within the context of just general behavioral issues. So we don't follow the same step-by-step -step, you know, verbal discussion first or a write-up or the 30-day suspension that we might for an adult firefighter uh, or member who's who's gone awry. Um, we are in a counseling role. And uh, so it'll either be the president of the company, uh, the chairman of the board, or me. And uh, the first thing we'll do is counsel this student. Uh, we'll pull in the parents. And uh, if necessary, we pull in the school district. The schools are a big help for that. Um, and uh, by developing a formal relationship with the school and that exchange of documents, the share, you know, the information share on behavior attendance and grades at school, you're better able to get a sense of how that student is doing at school is probably going to be reflected in how they perform at the firehouse. So by having that communication, then you can kind of nip a lot of things in the bud. Um, so I just, I really encourage that. The, the idea is to help these, help propel these kids forward, despite those times where they are doing their best effort to just trip over their own feet. You know, we kind of want to help them get out of their own way because they're not, as, as Tony writes about, um, intellectual development, they're not always making the right decisions because they don't have the capacity for it. They, you know, they, they still don't have a developed prefrontal cortex for impulse control, for thinking through everything rationally. They're working for a very emotional core of their brain. So everything is gonna have an emotional response. And oftentimes that response is out of whack for what we see as the reality of the situation, You know, making mountains out of molehills and things like that, or the downward spiral they can sometimes experience uh, when things are not going their way. So communication is really the key, being clear, being consistent, uh, being private. You know, the kids have a lot of, there's an ego riding on this, they're doing this. Their peers at school admire that they're doing this. I've done polls of asking students in, in my school, how do they view the junior firefighters? And I expected snarky comments. Instead, the words they shared is that they're responsible, they're mature, um, they're dependable, they're they're trustworthy, all of these things. And, the, and then these kids walk around and they know that they have to model that behavior. And when they slip up, which is going to happen, these kids are going to step over their own, you know, step on their own feet. They just need to be most times redirected. They don't need to have the... Um, the smackdown necessarily that we might give to an adult who knows better. We know they know better. Definitely. Um, Quentin, does that kind of echo your experience? It does. And a big thing for us is setting expectations. Uh, and that's part of our documents when we give the parents expectations and the children uh, that join our program expectations, because I always say, you know, you can't run a race if you don't know where the finish line's at. Uh, so that expectation setting is huge, but we also, we try to do this and it's something I think some of the fire services forgot over the years is, you know, when I was 16 years old, somebody come and put their arm around me and mentored me and showed me and told me what to do when I messed up and pulled me to the side. I don't think we're doing that enough in the fire service right now. And we, especially in junior programs, have to be the people stepping up, taking the lead, being that mentor, being that coach and helping these individuals grow because uh, Ellen's right. Even if they don't stay in the fire service, they're still in our community. And we want them to be good members of not only our community, but society as a whole. Yeah. I'd like to address one of the questions that was asked. Uh, Timothy Hoffman asked, how are you navigating working with schools with FERPA and other privacy laws? So FERPA is the Federal Educational uh, Educational Rights Protective Act, I believe. I'm a teacher and I should know that. We just call it FERPA. So privacy <laughs> laws for students. Um, that's the benefit of having that developed relationship with the school district. Uh, my school district, my my teachers, my peers will help recruit kids for us. They'll highlight kids themselves. So if in our packet of information, we ask the parents to sign a release, we note information that is mandatory, which would be behavior 
grades and attendance. And then we'll also note other things. Are there medical issues we need to be aware of? Are there medications that your child is taking that might impact their participation in certain activities? And it really behooves these parents to be honest because we wanna keep these students safe. And school is their job right now. The firehouse is extra. That could be their job down the road. But we want our kids to be successful in school. Then they feel good about themselves. They come to the firehouse and they feel good about themselves. And of course, legally, if a student is calling out sick from school, they can't be showing up at the firehouse to go on a call. Um, so that relationship is good, not just for the fire department or firehouse, but for the school district as well. And if the parents are willing to sign off on that, then there shouldn't be a problem. It's, it says our schools are not willing to work with us in recruitment, behavior grades, et cetera, with FERPA violations. So they're concerned about their liability. But if the parents are approving that, if your, your organization comes up with a form that provides you know, clarity of information and this is what we'll ask for, and the parents are okay with that, then you're off to the races. Right. And Jerry, I wanted to come back to you as well. Do you have anything to add on this on behavioral issues, uh, mentoring, kind of like steering the direction of our junior firefighters? Well, sure. You know, um, in the application, in our in our initial application, um, we have a medical form that they need to that they need to fill out and get signed off by the doctor to make sure they can participate in this in the different things. They might have health or behavioral issues, so um, so we see if there's any kind of uh, thing. Uh, that might restrict them from either joining the program or being able to participate in, in certain activities. And the biggest thing that we do is that if somebody wants to join it, whether the kid contacts the firehouse or contacts uh, an us through another kid, we make sure that the, before we even have a conversation, the parent comes up to the firehouse with the child and we sit down with the other advisors and we explain to them what the program is because a lot of parents don't really know what the program is about um and there are parents that they oh, you want to join yeah go ahead and, and you know they'll just go ahead you you got them for two hours for this friday um so we really make them understand what they do and our biggest thing is like um they'll learn from us as well as we'll tell them look go on social media go on this see what we do and a lot of parents are shocked i mean before all the, like I said, I've been doing it for 26 years before social media started. We used to do a PowerPoint at the end. We, we had like a mini installation dinner. We would swear the kids in once a year, but we would show a PowerPoint and parents would come up to me and he goes, I can't believe you do this stuff. This is great. He goes, every time my kid comes home from juniors, I said, what do you do? They go, nothing, you know, and <laughs> you know, this, 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 I can't believe the stuff that they're doing. They don't, you know, so they don't, what goes on between parent and child? Like I have three kids, so I know. Um, but we have a very open uh, dialogue between the parents and ourselves and the other advisors. This way, they, they totally know and understand what they're getting involved in. And as far as behavioral issues, most of the kids, and I think everybody will kind of agree, anybody who really gets into this program really wants to be there. There are very few kids that are really pushed in by a parent or somebody, oh, go, just go join something. So you know, the behavioral issues are probably going to be minim minimalized, I would say. We really haven't had too many issues. In 26 years, I had two instances where I had to call the parents up to sit down with the chief um, after, you know, constantly, you know, talking to the kid and everything. They just didn't do any good. Um, but I'll have parents come up to us or I'll have counselors like at, at the at the local parades. I'll have like, you know, people in the school saying, hey, how do you deal with so-and-so? He's a handful at school. He's a, I was like, well, I don't have any problem with them. You know? And they're like, really? I was like, yeah. If you institute that, a structure, the kids will know how much they can push. All the kids, they'll, they're going to test the waters. We do as adults. <laughs> um, but if you really show that there is consequences that you will not be able to participate in the program any longer, or you won't be able to come to a meeting, or you won't be able to do this or go on a certain outing training, they're kind of going to fall into place for the most part, for the, for the most part. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of the communication, setting expectations. Um, it's really coming across that the, this is part of the village. You're not operating by yourself. You're working right. with parents and schools to help guide these young people. 
Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I want to make sure that we have time to address our next question because we're getting a lot of questions in our chat about it too. Everyone wants to know what training are you doing? Um, you know, you've referenced showing these parents what you're doing, but what are you doing in your departments? How are you training juniors, you know, within the laws and restrictions in your state or region? And uh, I'll start with you, Jerry. So we, we try to model the training that we do in the fire department. So of course, you know, we can't use the hearse tool, we can't use power saws, we can't use torches, but we no problem putting them in gear, searches, radios. That's, they, they love getting on the radio. So we go off a, a different band and they can talk on the radios. We'll have somebody on a telephone mock a 911 operator, dispatch, you know, we'll go through the actual procedure from somebody calling 911 to a truck arriving on the scene. So, you know, they, we, we do things like that. We put them on the portable ladders. We'll put them on the aerial ladders. We'll put them on the trucks, pull hose, hit a hydrant, different types of nozzles, how to actually pump. We actually teach the kids actually how to pump. So there is an array of things. And I, I write for the FASNI magazine, and I just did an article, uh, the last thing saying, you know, we're coming into our winter months. Don't use all your inside trainings in good weather. Save those inside trainings because you're going to need them. And that's the biggest thing as an advisor, what we struggle with, trying to keep the, the kids engaged, that they don't get bored. Because if you're going to bring a kid to the firehouse and you're going to sit there and lecture them, and Ellen's a, you know, a perfect example, what do these kids go through? They, they're sitting in classroom getting lectured eight hours a day, five days a week. They don't want to come to the firehouse and listen, listen to you know, you know, somebody else do it for a couple of more hours. They want to, they want hands on. They want to do things. They want to go out. They want to, you know, mm -hmm. and get them into different activities and not just in the firehouse. We brought our kids bowling uh, two weeks ago. Uh, one of the parents is a manager at the lane. She, she goes, bring them up here. You don't think you have to pay for his food. So we, we brought them out bowling. We got them out of the, the, uh, the, uh, the setting of the firehouse, but you know, once in a while to do fun things uh, that there are other things to, you know, to do to keep them engaged and keep, keep their, you know, their minds going. And it works out well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Ellen, how about you? Uh, in line with what Jerry's saying, uh, we're a small company, so our kids are thrown into the mix. Our trainings, uh, if we're out in a parking lot or whatever it might be, wherever might be doing our training, then the kids have an adult working with them on the support skills. So they're going to be setting up the tarp. So the first job they have to have is to be able to identify, find, and understand the purpose of every tool on every piece of apparatus. So that's their role in a lot of trainings. If we are having uh, new drivers do pump ops or something like that, then we have the students out there flowing hand lines, which they love. Um, you know, they're able to at different ages perform different tasks. So the 16 year olds are on brush fires or trash fires or car fires and things like that. So um, first they learn how to take care of, or first they learn all the components of a piece of equipment, say an SCBA, and then they're helping maintain those with oversight. And then eventually they're packing up and using that, even just wearing it around before they're then on air performing tasks, you know, the kind of these mock searches and whatnot um, so that they have a comfort level before they are uh, fighting fire an exterior fire before they have interior training and then able to do that. So everything is gradual. It's step by step. You start with the simplest things. If we're doing, we have uh, wrecked cars in our back lot to work on as we have a lot of highway responses. So uh, there's a lot you can do with a screwdriver <laughs> once the hearse keys are put away, right? So, and the students love that. Um, and we don't really have a, we don't have a problem with boredom unless we're holding them in the classroom too long. So here's what we're gonna do today. This is what it looks like. This is the information for you to put in your handbook. Um, or your notebook, and now we're going to go outside, get dressed. We'll have them dressed for time, uh, posted on the board. So now they're trying to beat one another and beat us in, in gearing up. And then let's go outside and do some work, even if it's only for half an hour because of the weather. Quentin, how about your department? Uh, again, I, I can't say nothing else other than Jerry and Ellen said about what their departments are doing. But from the NBFC side, big push as a director here uh the core competencies uh section there is actually a, on the junior web page is a core competencies for training section it covers 19 sections and each of those sections has an explanation of you know what you can expect a junior to do and then it has actual drills and if you scroll down in the document 
it's got drills from five or six different departments, junior programs on how to perform those drills with your juniors. So it's again, a good place to start if you don't know, but the big thing is our goal is to make sure our juniors, once they turn 18 and become full fledged firefighters are ready to go on day one. The only way we do that is by teaching them the core competencies and those core technical skills that they're going to need. So that day one, when they're ready, they're ready to get on the truck and do the job like we want them to. Right. Yeah, well, we're we're in our home stretch here with the last 10 minutes of our call, but something I wanted to make sure and ask you is just like juniors, as adults, we learn from our mistakes. So is there anything that um, as you have learned this position, as you've become someone who gets invited on a panel that you really had to learn from and take and take back? And um, I'll start with you, Quentin. Uh, I definitely did. Uh, we used to go to the high school at lunch every year. and We would uh, sit around and hang out with the kids and uh, have a little program that afternoon. The school would build it up and uh, we had a PowerPoint presentation and we would go deliver it after school. And when we first started doing this, I knew a lot of kids. I knew their brothers and sisters and I was probably 19 or 20 years old doing the program. And I'd have 30 people in the classroom in the afternoon and we may get 10 juniors out of it, which was awesome. But when I was 32 years old, I was still doing it. Uh, and I didn't know none of these kids. I didn't know none of their uh, friends. I actually was friends with their parents. So uh, I was not being able to reach the audience I needed to reach. And our numbers kept dwindling and dwindling. And we figured out, hey, light bulb, we need to uh, bring some younger people. Some of our juniors are actually in the high school or some that have just come out of the program uh, that match their demographics that are different races, different genders different uh ages because uh 32 year old white quentin was not the answer anymore no That's a, i think we all have to look in the mirror at some point and be like am i connecting with you 100 <laughs> percent. i mean when we, i spoke about even i spoke about the you know going into the schools and doing recruitment and stuff like that i've i'll, I'll have like two sentences for the the hour assembly and i'll let the kids kind of go with the uh, with with everything and speak to them and go out you know have the gear on and just kind of talk and especially the, the females um I always make sure I bring a couple of girls saying you know this and uh, I'm an officer I you know I do this I do that you know and uh you know you have to you have to talk at your group like you know Quinn said it says they don't they don't listen to the gray head old guy you know they're gonna be like I don't want to go listen to this guy talk at the firehouse so you know they're gonna want to uh, work and meet with the peers. And that's why we have such a great success with the county association. The whole association is run by the six kids. You know, they run the meetings, they speak at the meetings. We just stand off to the side and we just speak when it's time to give an advisor's report. They do everything and they talk to the kids. And even at the trainings that we hold, they are in control of mainly speaking mostly. We off to the side, we just kind of get them back on track if they, they go off uh, track a little bit. But you know, you got to get your, you got to get your target audience. You got to get your, um, you know, uh, you have to get somebody who they're going to identify with. It's just an, another, another uh, youth. Definitely. Ellen, did you have any lessons learned that you wanted to share? I'm in agreement uh, with Jerry. Let the kids work. Um, we can show them something once or show them a video about something once, but then put the tools, put the rope in their ha hands, let them figure it out. Don't quickly go to here, let me do that. Um, you know, as parents might want to, you're looking at the time, you're looking at the clock saying, oh gosh, we got to hustle on and, and, and do something else. Why haven't they been able to open that hydrant yet? Um, and if anybody's going to help them, let another junior help them out. Um, sometimes it's the newest junior who's able to help one of the other ones who maybe hasn't been coming around yet because they just learned that skill. It's fresh in their brains and they want to show that they know it. And then they'll kind of show up the older kids who now realize like, oh, I haven't been here in a month. I need to uh, get back involved. And the other thing I learned is that um, um, when you're a teacher in a school, you really love to see students succeed. We all go to the musicals, the football games and things like that. Um, and what I found is our teachers really like seeing our junior firefighters succeed. So every year we do, um, or my students do, my junior firefighters do the annual required safety, lab safety course uh, for its professional development for the science department. So they're planning that for March. They've got their PowerPoint they're developing. They grab some fire extinguishers to bring them to school. And uh, they discuss how the, the sprinkler system works, what the emergency response would look like, why pull boxes are at exits as they are, you know, what's the responsibility of a teacher in a, in a 
classroom environment. Um, and then we they take the teachers outside in the science department and most of them, well, now they have, thanks to the juniors, but then they have them uh, learn how to use a fire extinguisher, which most people have never used before. So now they're learning from their students. And I share those I share those pictures staff wide with my peers and invariably I get a comment from a teacher to saying it's so great to see you know x student being so involved in that because they're really involved in nothing else. We might we grab the athletes but we also grab the kids who don't have anything else to do and the firehouse became becomes a place where they can be successful uh, and to be able to showcase that to their teachers and their peers um, those are those are lifelong lessons for everybody, so. Absolutely. Yeah, again, I think something that's really come out of this conversation is the idea of communicating, working with everyone from the juniors themselves and getting them involved and out in the community um, to your principals, your teachers, the parents, and it being a real, a real team effort. So um, I really appreciate all of your insight. This has just been a fantastic conversation. We somehow are already at the end of our hour. So just a few things. Quentin has done a great job plugging all the MBFC resources for us, but just uh, I did drop the link in the chat and we will follow up with everyone who attended this session with that link. Um, lots of templates, sample documents, drill examples, all kinds of things to help you get started or grow your program. So we'll make sure that you have that. Um, the NBFC has all kinds of other tools for all your other programs, and we do these uh, monthly roundtable talks and webinar series, so we hope to see you on another one. And just a huge thank you to our three panelists, because this insight is really going to help a lot of people, um, and we appreciate your time today. So one last thing before you log off, I hope everyone will fill out the post-session evaluation that helps us keep improving our programs. Um, and until the next time, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.